and get started. All right, we are thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the Quantum Seminar series dedicated to the research and the academic quantum communities. This seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time right now and is hosted on our Kiskit YouTube channel. So you can make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. Again, hi, I'm your host for today. My name is Olivia Lanes from IBM Quantum. I'm very excited to be able to be here today and to introduce our speaker, Professor Monica Schuyler Smith. Just as a quick introduction, Professor Shiler Smith received her BA in 2005 from Harvard University, having studied chemistry and physics and math. She subsequently pursued her graduate career in experimental atomic physics at MIT. After she received her PhD in 2011, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute for quantum optics and liquid at the Lidwood Maximilian University in Munich before arriving at Stanford and beginning her professorship in the fall of 2013. So Monica, how's it going? Great. How are you? I'm good. I'm really excited to hear about this topic, actually. So I think we're just about ready to get started. I'm going to bring up your slides here now. And uh, yeah, we'll let you take it away. Or okay. I'll interrupt if there are any questions throughout. So if anyone has any questions in the chat, please feel free to ask. And when there is an opportune moment, I will do my best to very politely interrupt. Yes, please do feel free to ask questions. I like knowing that there's an audience out there um, while talking to my screen here. So um, thanks again for the invitation to participate in this seminar series. The title of my talk today is Choreographing Quantum Spin Dynamics with Light. And it's a talk about some experiments we're doing in uh, my group at Stanford on advancing really control over the interactions between uh, laser cooled atoms. And in particular, uh, the sort of motivating vision uh, behind this is, is the dream that I might one day have in my lab, um, something like uh, an arbitrary waveform generator for quantum mechanics, where I could say today I would like to work with this particular quantum state um, or this particular Hamiltonian, and I could you know, ideally press some buttons and program it in and press play and um, start doing my quantum science experiments. Um, now, um, you know that might sound like an ambitious um, goal, um, but actually, we are, uh, the field of, of cold atoms has come really a remarkable way over the past few years um, in terms of starting to have really highly programmable um, quantum systems. And so here are um, some pictures I've taken from um, a few different groups around the world where, for example, it's possible to use optical tweezers to program the, pos the positions of, of individual atoms um, in arrays, like these, these 1D or D chains here, or even two-dimensional or three-dimensional structures. Um, and um, so this kind of is a nice illustration of the high degree of control one has um, with, with laser light. Um, what I'll be talking about today, we'll actually be asking, um, can we uh, take this idea of, of, of using optical programmability to start to really um, program actually the interactions between atoms with light? Because if you'd like to sort of um, do anything from, let's say, implementing um, quantum gates to um, perhaps um, studying uh, uh, questions in, in the, the physics of many interacting particles, um, that's a key ingredient that we need are the interactions. And in particular, um, in the pictures I've drawn here, uh, I, I've, uh, uh, I've shared here, um, you'll notice that the sort of typical spacing um, with which one can trap and image and manipulate atoms is on the micron scale set by the wavelength of light. Um, and so in order um, to use these as um, sort of platforms for um, uh, quantum science, one thing that you want to be able to do is also have interactions that are um, long ranged compared to this sort of micron scale um, on which we can trap and manipulate atoms. Um, and so the focus of my talk today will be on asking how can we use light to controllably turn on um, long range interactions between atoms. So um, the motivations um, come for, for this come from a variety of different directions. Um, one is you might want to be able to program the interactions between atoms in order to um, engineer some particular entangled quantum state that might have applications ranging from um, computation to precision sensing. Um, Maybe you would like to um, program a particular Hamiltonian into your system that um, is believed to be interesting, but where it's hard to actually calculate its properties, its ground states, or its dy dy dynamics on a classical computer. Um, if we can build the system, um, then we can use this as a platform to directly simulate the dy dynamics and learn something, perhaps using these atoms about other fields ranging from condensed matter physics to even uh, quantum gravity. Um, so I'll touch on some of those directions later. Um, a third motivation 
um, might be that you want to solve um, some classical computational problem. Um, and in many cases, um, they're actually hard computational problems that um, can be mapped, um, let's say optimization problems that you'd encounter in the real world, but you, that you could map to the problem of finding the minimum energy state of some interacting quantum system. And so if you can build that right, the correct structure of interactions, maybe you can find a way to use the quantum system to better solve that classical problem. Um, so I thought I always like to have a concrete example in mind. So I thought I would start with one example from this um, uh, uh, sphere here of um, optimization problems. So here's a problem that um, one routinely encounters um, in a uh, university, which is that you need to schedule classes in such a way that um, students get to take the classes that they want. So a simple example of this is um, imagine I have um, just two possible time slots in which I can schedule lectures, the morning slot and the afternoon slot. Um, and I have a bunch of students um, who uh, uh, have, have you know, different classes they'd like to take. Um, and I'd like to sort of optimize things so that students, if they want to take two different classes, those classes are in different time slots. So one way you could sort of um, formalize this problem is I could draw a graph where the vertices are the different lectures, all the different lectures that the students might want to take. And the edges are weighted by the number of students that want to take both of these, of these lectures. So if there's a heavy weight, that means lots of students would like to take both of these classes. Um, so in order to kind of optimize my scheduling, what I ought to do is if there is a heavy weight on a particular edge, um, what I should do is have one of those classes um, be in the morning and the other one be in the afternoon. So I want to sort of cut the heavily weighted edges. Um, and as a physicist, I look at this and say, oh, so this actually looks like an interacting spin system with antiferromagnetic interactions. Um, on these edges. In other words, right, red and blue are two different spin states, spin up and spin down. And if there's a strong interaction here, um, I want those spins to be um, anti-aligned. So generically, this is, I think, a nice example of how you take some um, sort of classical real world problem um, and map it to um, some Hamiltonian, which is essentially just a system of Ising interactions. Um, the spins with strong um, uh, interactions want to anti-align. And um, now you can start to ask questions about, you know, can quantum mechanics help to solve this problem? Um, and one thing you certainly will want to do if quantum mechanics is to help you um, is I need to add some non-commuting terms to this Hamiltonian, or in other words, I need ways for the spins to be able to flip. So um, generically, there's sort of a class of approaches that involve in some way asking if I have um, these interactions and um, some additional transverse field that can cause the spins to flip. Um, maybe I can use that um, to sort of um, steer the system into the lowest energy state of this uh, of this Hamiltonian that would solve my classical problem. So if you'd like to be able to start, um, and you know, I won't show you any demonstration of this today, but I want to sort of use this to motivate um, the toolbox that if you'd like to start exploring problems like this, some ingredients you need are a way of encoding a spin, um, some way of programming um, the interactions between the spins, um, and those interactions, again, need to be um, uh, relatively long range so that you can realize some, some interesting graph here. Um, so, okay, there are two different physical systems that I'll um, discuss in my talk today where we have um, different aspects of, of this toolbox. The first one I'll talk about is one um, where we couple atoms to Rydberg states, which are highly polarizable states that allow the, the atoms to interact on the scale of um, several microns. Um, so these can be these are interactions that I would call long range but local, and then later in the talk I'll get to a platform we, where we can have sort of even um, even longer range millimeter scale um, uh, range of interactions by letting photons carry information between one atom and another. Okay, so those are the two platforms we'll be talking about today. I'll, I'll start with this this one on the left, um, and so um, the the basic concept is if I um, have you know a ground state atom. Um, uh, and I were to have two ground state atoms, they, uh, they won't interact with each other at all on micron scale distances, the atom is too small. Um, but um, if I excite the atom, the, the outermost electron to a state of a high principal quantum number, this is sort of an illustration for a cesium atom, which is something we work with in our lab, the ground state atom is this blue dot here, um, but we can excite it with a laser to a state of principal quantum number around 40, and um, the radius of the atom will scale as, as this number n squared. So you quickly have a very large, um, very polarizable atom that can interact over much longer distances than the ground state atom. Um, and in fact, the van der Waals interactions between these atoms scale as this principal quantum number to the 11th power. 
So this um, readily gives rise to very strong interactions on the few micron length scale. Um, and this general idea of um, coupling atoms to Rydberg states uh, in order um, to, to generate interacting systems of neutral atoms has been explored in a number of platforms and used um, to realize um, uh, uh, highly entangled states um, to simulate some phenomena from condensed matter physics. Um, and there are sort of different um, frameworks for how you can use these Rydberg atoms. Um, in some experiments, one works directly with the atoms in the Rydberg states. Um, the one sort of um, limitation there um, is that the, the lifetime of these states is sort of on the, the 100 microsecond scale. So it is a, a finite lifetime. Um, and um, the interactions are sort of always on. If you'd like a higher degree of kind of programmability of the interactions, you might want to work with atoms um, that are in stable ground states, um, but couple to these Rydberg states um, off resonantly in such a way as to kind of mix in some of the interacting character um, while the laser field is on. Um, and this gives a way of having optically programmable interactions. And this has been a focus of, of work um, in, in our lab recently. Um, so the general concept um, is kind of, of what the experiment looks like is, is shown here. Um, in the experiments I'll show you today, um, it's, it's not this setting of looking at individual atoms. Um, it's, it's sort of a messier setting of just a cloud of atoms in, in an optical trap. Um, and what we do is we illuminate some portion of that cloud um, with a laser field that uh, is essentially off resonantly coupling one of two stable ground states to a Rydberg state. And in particular, actually, the, the states that are convenient for us to work with that we encode the spin in um, are the so-called clock states of a cesium atom. Um, this is actually the energy difference between these states is what defines the second, um, hence the name clock. Um, but what we do is we have a laser that um, essentially mixes in a little bit of the character of the Rydberg state into one of these two ground states. Um, and the effect of that is to essentially um, turn on when the laser field is on um, some, some interaction um, that the potential looks sort of like what I've shown here. Um, it's kind of flat out to some distance of a few microns um, and, and then, and then um, uh, decays with distance. I can think of this as coming about from the fact that if I had two atoms that are very far apart, uh, they would essentially um, have see some energy shift from this light that is off resonantly um, coupled, coupling the atom to the excited state. And if the atoms are very close together, that energy shift is essentially suppressed by the fact that the interactions push that light way off resonance. OK, so that's the general concept. And the effect you expect to get from this is precisely um, an Ising type interaction, similar to what I um, showed on, on a previous slide. So um, this is um, what I expect is something where the energy of, of one atom um, depends um, uh, let, let me let me say it this way. I have an interaction that scales as sigma zi, sigma zj, where these are the z components of, of two different atoms. But that actually tells me that if one of these atoms were in a superposition of spin up and spin down, it would it would process at a rate that depends on the z components of the surrounding spins. Um, and that's something we can measure in our experiment. So here's an experiment where I'm looking at sort of the magnetization in some region of the cloud. And I initialize the system um, in, in different experiments in a few different possible orientations of that um, spin vector. Um, that's sort of the, the total spin of some clump of atoms in a region of the cloud that I'm looking at. Um, and as a function of um, the tilt of that spin vector, what we see, um, these are data, what we see is that the, the, the spin kind of processes in a way that is faster if the spin is tilted more up and slower if the spin is tilted more down. And this matches what we would expect from this Ising type interaction that each atom feels an effective field um, that depends on the states of the surrounding spins. Um, I'll mention that one reason that this is actually interesting, I motivated these I Ising models in the context of optimization problems earlier, but a second reason why this is interesting is that um, these same dynamics are actually known to be able to give rise to a phenomenon known as spin squeezing. Um, and that is to say, in the experiment I showed you, we're sort of intentionally um, changing the initial spin polarization of our state. But you could also have a situation where um, the only um, variation in the tilt is coming from quantum fluctuations. And that sort of a twisting dynamics actually squeezes those quantum fluctuations in a way that actually provides a state that is um, a useful resource um, for um, enhancing precision measurements. Um, and in particular, um, the, the sort of key ingredient there is that the interactions between the spins can give rise to entanglement. 
Um, I want to say a little bit more about this. So this is a, a direction that um, we're um, uh, uh, moving towards pursuing with this system. And um, just to kind of motivate it a little bit, um, uh, you know, why would you like to make these uh, entangled states and systems of, of, of cold atoms? Um, there are a number of applications where these cold atom platforms are used to make extraordinarily precise measurements already from sort of the best um, uh, clocks or, you know, atomic clocks built of systems of cold atoms. And they're getting to be so precise that they're envisioned as eventually even being used as sensors. They're sensitive to changes in the gravitational field. Um, uh, and uh, if you can sort of keep pushing their precision forward, you can start to envision even using these um, for fundamental physics experiments, like detecting gravitational waves. Um, uh, we do have one question, know. Monica, yeah. mm -hmm. um, before we go too much farther, I thought, sure. yeah. real quick. We yeah. have some people asking if you could elaborate a little bit more on what spin squeezing is and how this fits in, I guess, with this picture of a spin being up or down. Yeah, um, great, thank you. Um, th that's a great question. So. Um, Essentially, what I've what I'm kind of showing here in this in this picture on the left um, is some visualization of um, a system that is um, composed of of many spins, um, which on average are pointing. Unfortunately, I didn't label any axes here, but they're pointing towards the center of this red blob on average. Um, and if I were to now measure the magnetization along some direction, like the vertical direction here, which which should be labeled z, um, what I would see is that essentially measuring the z component of, of this you know, collection of spins um, amounts to basically counting how many spins are up and how many spins are down. Um, and if you do that type of a measurement, it's kind of like doing a coin toss. And you'll see some, um, you know, if I have um, n spins, I'll see some fluctuations that go as the square root of n. And that's kind of physically why when I'm, what I drew here was not just a vector or a point on the sphere, but some sort of a fuzzy blob which is illustrating the fact that when I do a measurement, there are some fluctuations in the measurement outcome that come from this process of projecting the spin into up or down. Um, now, um, those in general, they're, so there are fluctuations in sort of any direction about the mean spin. Um, and uh, if you have the right type of interaction though, those fluctuations can kind of get distorted so that um, there's a Heisenberg uncertainty principle that says, um, the product of fluctuations in sort of two orthogonal directions um, is subject to a fundamental limit. Um, but you can reduce the fluctuations in one direction at the expense of greater fluctuations in another direction. Um, and that can allow you um, to then uh, do a more precise measurement. Um, and, and it's easy once you've done this to do any rotation to make yourself sensitive. Let's say if I have a magnetic field that will make these spins process in a certain direction, I would set it up so that the narrow direction is the one um, that changes when when the spins process. Um, does that does that help? Uh, it makes sense to me. Yeah, I think. Great, great. Um, yeah, and and so should I? Um, were there other questions at this point? Um, I think we're good for now. I'll interrupt if there are more in a minute. Okay. Yeah. So I I was just kind of motivating. You know, reasons you would want to do this in atomic systems are. Um, um, particularly applications, let's say, in, in um, atomic clocks that can even be used as sensors um, in magnetometry or electrometry. Um, and so in all of these, these applications, um, many of these devices are actually at the point where their precision is limited by precisely this sort of coin toss noise that I described, that sort of each spin randomly ends up in, in the up or the down state, and that adds some statistical uncertainty to the measurement. To the measurement. Um, so if you can use the interactions to generate an entangled state like this, that can have a number of different applications ranging from sort of giving you higher precision in fixed time, but also perhaps to enhancing um, other figures of merit, um, like the, the dynamic range of a sensor or its spatial resolution. Um, and so I should mention that this general concept of sort of generating entangled states um, that are squeezed or have other forms of um, uh, uh, sort of metrologically useful entanglement is actually um, a field where there's been lots of demonstrations around the world um, that are starting to push beyond sort of this black line, which is the best precision you can get without entanglement. Um, and, and so, you know, you might ask, why do we want to start exploring this in uh, one other physical system? Um, but, but, and the answer is that in some sense, there are still, um, while there's sort of a, a rich field now of, of um, uh, demonstrations of entanglement enhanced um, uh, uh, measurements at the proof of principle level, there are still lots of outstanding challenges in terms of um, how does one design the states, for example, to be maximally robust to noise and decoherence. Um, 
how does one improve figures of merit other than just the absolute precision um, and ask about sort of um, things like what is the dynamic range of the sensor I can build. Um, and it turns out that there, it, tur it it's actually useful to be able to have systems where one can make just not one single, um, let's say, large entangled state of many atoms, but also program locally um, the structure of the quantum correlations. And this is a direction that I think is very exciting in terms of um, having the ability to have interactions that we can locally control with laser light. Um, and so that brings me to kind of um, one other um, sort of picture from, from this experiment I showed you before. Earlier, I kind of showed that these Ising interactions manifest in the spins um, processing at a rate that depends on um, the surrounding spins, the states of the surrounding spins. Um, I can sort of show that, I've summarized that here in a picture where I'm actually looking at this effect as a function of position in my cloud of atoms. So the horizontal direction um, uh, is position in, in the cloud of atoms. The vertical direction is the tilt with which I initiated these spins. Um, and so, so each line here is a different experiment. Um, but what you're seeing is that sort of the strength of this twisting effect, which is indicated by the color. So the color is the phase. Um, and if I see red on the bottom and blue at the top, that means the, this twisting effect of the interactions is strong. You can see that that strength is actually um, locally controlled by the intensity of the laser light. So it's strongest here in the middle where the light is strongest. So that's kind of a nice illustration of the optical programmability of these interactions. Okay. Um, and so, so again, this is potentially then a, a route to making, for example, um, sort of locally controlled arrays of entangled states. There are sort of benefits to this local control. Um, there are also potential um, limitations to having these interactions um, be um, restricted to sort of a range of a few microns. Um, it limits in some sense um, how large an entangled state you could imagine preparing unless you have a way for correlations generated between one spin and another spin whose precession rate it affects to sort of um, travel across the system and for correlations in the system to spread. And so it's been pointed out that um, if one wants to kind of um, optimally control these states, you would like to have not only interactions, but also a transverse field, which can result in one spin here, affecting the precession rate of this other spin down the line, rotating that precession into a, a, a tilt of the spin that will affect another spin further away. So ideally, what you would like is to be able to build a transverse field Ising model. I've also mo motivated that before in the context of um, uh, quantum optimization. Um, so we decided, let's see whether we can um, you know, realize this type of transverse field Ising model. And so the basic concept is in our system, what's easiest to do um, is actually, or what's convenient to do is to alternate between applying these interactions by turning on our laser and applying a spin rotation which um, physically actually is induced by a microwave coupling between these two um, ground states in the cesium atom. And if we alternate between those two quickly, then we'll have effectively um, this, this transverse fieldizing model that's the sum of the interactions and, yeah, and, and, and the field. So I think uh, I understand yeah. what you're saying here, Monica. This is just my mm -hmm. question. But what did you mean by convenient exactly in, in this sense? Great, yeah. So um, in principle, you could imagine just turning on the laser light and the microwaves at the same time. Right. Um, and you might think um, that should be just as good and that directly realizes this model. Um, now in practice, there are two things. One thing I sort of glossed over is that it turns out whenever we apply the laser light to generate these interactions, what we do is actually a little bit fancier than, than what I said, which is we always um, use what's called a spin echo technique to take mm -hmm. out any average energy shift um, due to the light and only keep the part that, that's this interaction term. Um, so that's um, so, so it's actually a pulsed sequence of applying light, applying um, a microwave pulse, and then applying some more light just to generate this Ising interaction term. Um, on top of that, there, there's the possibility that if we applied the microwaves and the light at the same time, the Rydberg levels will get shifted around by the microwaves. So there are sort of two reasons why we like to separate out these two parts and do this um, in, in a form where we rapidly alternate between the two. Okay, cool. Um, great, and so, um, okay, so what happens if we do this? Um, we'll again look at kind of the, these mean field dynamics of the average um, magnetization and how it behaves. Um, okay, a very simple case is if we have um, only the transverse field, you would expect that, um, so what I've shown here is um, again, kind of the, the average magnetization and um, this is the, so these axes are Z and Y, so X is the one that's kind of into the slide. Um, and so if I just have um, the transverse field, I should see some spin precession about X. The squares here are kind of different initial states and the circles are the trajectories starting from those different initial states. And this, you see the spin starting to process. 
Um, if we instead um, now start to turn on interactions, um, what we see is that kind of the flow lines of this um, uh, of this uh, local magnetization start to start to change. Um, and in particular, one way to think about this is um, that um, it's useful to think about sort of what are the ground states of this Hamiltonian. In the case where I had only the transverse field along x, the ground state would be the, the spins point along x. And in the dynamics, what we see is that the system, that ground state is a fixed point of the dynamics. Um, and if we start um, um, at some offset from that, we see kind of a precession around that fixed point. So what we saw here is when we turn on the interactions, we actually see two new fixed points of the dynamics um, tilted uh, um, up and down in Z. And that um, matches what you would expect for the ground states of a system um, with these um, ferromagnetic Ising interactions. The spins want to align with each other either up or down, and that gives rise to these new fixed points. And so we're seeing kind of a dynamical signature here of a phase transition from a paramagnetic state to a ferromagnetic state. Um, and one kind of cute thing in this experiment is that um, we actually can operate at these different interaction strengths just by looking at different regions of our atomic cloud. So on the right here is the picture I showed you where we only had the interactions and we just saw the twisting was strongest in the center of the cloud. But if we also turn on the transverse field, um, I'll remind you the color here is the phase of the magnetization locally. The tilt, the vertical axis is the initial tilt and horizontal is position in the cloud. And so what you're seeing here is there's a region. So the white color, we always initialize the spins at phase zero, which is white. So if I have a fixed point of the dynamics, the phase will stay white. And what you see is in the wings of the cloud where there's a transverse field but no interactions, um, there's a single fixed point. And as we move towards the center of the cloud where the interactions are strong, that bifurcates into two new fixed points that are these, um, these uh, ferromagnetic ground states. Um, and so I think this is a nice kind of illustration of um, really, the, again, the local optical control of the interactions. In this case, we have um, uh, one part of the system that's in this um, paramagnetic phase and another part that's in the ferromagnetic phase, depending on the strength of these spatially varying interactions compared to the transverse field. Um, so just to kind of summarize what I've shown you here in this Rydberg system, um, we can generate Ising interactions. Um, we can control them optically. Um, and um, one sort of nice signature of the spatial control we've seen is, is this, um, this, this phase transition from paramagnetic to ferromagnetic. Um, in terms of sort of directions, uh, we would like to take this. Um, on the one hand, I mentioned um, directions in quantum metrology, so using these interactions to generate entangled states, um, but also the optical programmability of the interactions is ideal for starting to explore um, some of these um, optimization problems, like the one I uh, uh, described to you earlier in the talk. Um, and specifically, um, actually, precisely this sort of pattern of alternating between interactions in a transverse field. Um, I should say this is something that becomes interesting if you do it in a setting where you're looking at the individual atoms, right? So that I can really um, ask um, uh, uh, about the state of each individual spin, right? That's what I want in order to solve one of these problems. Um, but this this sort of um, scheme of alternating between interactions in a transverse field is precisely what's needed for what's known as the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, um, which is one of the um, approaches that's, that's being explored um, for um, asking, can you solve hard optimization problems um, more efficiently in quantum systems? Um, and um, to the best of my understanding, there are still um, significant open theoretical questions about, you know, to what extent this can help and, and whether it can give you a quantum speed up for interesting problems. Um, so I'll just mention that we've also been thinking about sort of other approaches um, to combinatorial optimization in this system. Um, and uh, uh, so there are other um, uh, sort of uh, paradigmatic, there's another paradigmatic um, optimization problem known as number partitioning, which is essentially I have a bunch of objects with different weights and I want to know whether there's a way to divide them into groups that balance a scale. Um, and this is also something that's natural to encode in a spin model where um, uh, uh, in this particular case, you would want one Rydberg atom that strongly interacts with a number of surrounding atoms with interaction strengths that set these weights. Um, and so one neat thing that we've, we realized is that actually this type of a configuration gives a way of actually implementing sort of a quantum search algorithm that is known to offer a speed up, namely Grover's algorithm, um, to directly search for solutions to this problem. So um, if you're interested in learning more about that, we recently put a, a theoretical paper on this idea up on, on the archive. I'm going to pause here um, and, and briefly ask actually whether there are other questions, because other if not, I'm going to actually switch gears and say a little bit about a different platform um, that allows sort of even more uh, 
versatile control over, uh, over extraordinarily long range and non-local interactions. We did have one question. I'm not exactly sure what slide they were referring to, mm -hmm. unfortunately, but this person asked, is applying these, can applying these transverse fields have any impact in error correction? That is an interesting question. Um, so I, I might punt a little bit on this because I, I don't know of a, a concrete example where um, uh, yeah, don't where it helps with error correction, but but I do think that basically to do sort of um, anything quantum, an, an Ising model by itself is essentially looks classical because there are no no terms that that don't commute with each other. So um, so in some sense you need a transverse field. What I will say this is this is slightly different, but maybe related. Um, so um, I talked about optimization, where you want to use the you're basically using this transverse field Ising model as a way of trying to solve a, a classical problem. Um, right, and it's just a way of sort of steering you into the ground state of the classicalizing Hamiltonian. But there's another kind of um, paradigm that, that so, and there are questions about sort of whether that helps or not to solve the classical problem. But whether or not it helps there, one thing that is for sure is if you're trying to solve a quantum problem, like a quantum control problem, I want to use these interactions to make a particular quantum state, um, then some of these same approaches of, for example, this um, uh, something like this quantum approximate optimization algorithm can be adapted to actually quantum control problems and saying, how do I optimally steer my system um, into a particular quantum state? And I do think there are really interesting questions there about sort of also how do you design those types of algorithms to be maximally robust to errors, for example. Mm. Maybe there is some connection there to, to error correction. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good way of answering it. Let me see if there's anything else. Um... Another person asked, a lot of this looks a lot like the process of interacting with spins and in V centers. Is there some type of relationship? Um, yeah, that's yeah. a great question. Um, actually, I think one, uh, so, so there are um, strong parallels between, I would say, you know, these um, interactions in the Rydberg system and interactions you might have in, in solid state spin systems. Um, and um, there are, uh, for, and for example, it would be really exciting to be able to make um, these squeeze states in like dense on dense spin ensembles um, uh, in NV systems in order to have kind of really like technologically relevant um, sensors in, in you know in the solid state um, that are enhanced by entanglement and, and where you're sort of getting a higher um, combination of precision and spatial resolution by entanglement. And one direction that I think um, atomic physics experiments can play is we do to some extent have um, some differences in sort of what observables we have and our ability to sort of um, uh, really have, uh, you know, um, some very nice tools in terms of imaging the, the spins ultimately at, at the single atom level. What that I think you can start to use to, to, to sort of explore what I would call quantum simulation for metrology. So you'd like to understand sort of how do you use, like a question like how should I optimally use these short range interactions to generate um, long range entangled entanglement um, that's that's metrologically useful and um, there it's not always actually um, something you can just solve on a classical computer to figure out how do I steer the system into the right entangled state um, but so this is something where potentially I think with cold atom experiments um, and the tunability of the interactions that we have there you can learn something that then maybe you could actually then apply in your NV system um, uh, in a sensor that's maybe more application ready in the sense of being like just a, a solid state device. So I think that's a, a really kind of cool direction. And I'll also just say that we've, we're actually interested in drawing inspiration from sensing protocols that were first proposed for NV systems, like this type of architecture of a central spin coupled to a surrounding bath of spins. Um, there are ideas for using that to approach fundamental limits in, in precision measurement in a way that's robust to disorder. And that's something where actually you could also um, learn from those ideas and, and actually implement them in these solid state systems. So I, I agree there are strong parallels and, and they're, I think, really exciting to explore. Yeah, for sure. All right, awesome. Um, I guess we, we should move on from now. Yeah, great. Okay, so um, I'll switch gears a little bit and tell you about, um, uh, so, so one kind of um, potential limitation in this Rydberg system is that the interactions do necessarily um, d decay with distance. Um, and that gives, for example, in, in the example I gave of optimization, some limitations on the type of, um, of interaction graphs you can realize. Um, uh, so there are a number of reasons why you might like to have even more control over the structure of interactions and not be restricted to have them even be um, sort of local spatially. And so there's a second platform we work on in my lab where we have photons that convey information between distant spins. Um, 
And again, that that is relevant for a number of the different um, sort of um, spheres of application I mentioned earlier. Um, but just to give kind of one um, example of why you might want to make very exotic, non-local kinds of interactions, um, one direction that um, we've been inspired by is the question of, um, can you build um, toy models in the lab of um, that might help us um, elucidate some, um, uh, uh, that might help us um, explore questions from the area of quantum gravity, which you might think is something you could never probe in the lab. So, okay, what do I mean by that? The fact that you could even um, dream of, of doing something like that um, comes from the fact that there's um, a conjectured duality um, under which if I have some quantum many body system in my lab in let's say D spatial dimensions, like here's an example of a, a 1D um, spin chain perhaps, um, I drew it um, with periodic boundary conditions which might not be so physical, but anyway, I have some quantum system in my lab in, in, in D spatial dimensions um, and in certain situations, it's understood that there's actually a way of sort of mapping that quantum system. Um, the, so the equations that derive that describe that quantum system onto a classical system with one additional dimension, um, but with gravity. Um, and the way to think about this is there's sort of a way of um, visualizing the correlations um, and the entanglement in the quantum system in terms of um, kind of space time curvature. And I, I find this a fascinating idea because in general, sort of writing down a description of a quantum many body system um, is something that quickly becomes intractable. And the idea that there are some cases where a strongly interacting quantum system has some simpler representation um, in terms of kind of, um, you know, visual representation, representation in terms of curved space is a fascinating idea. Um, so to me, that sort of raises the question, you know, is this um, a phenomenon that can be probed in experiments, um, uh, either in, in, you know, simple model systems that are theoretically understood, or in cases where this theoretical mapping isn't known to exist, but could you perhaps discover it um, by doing some measurements on, on, on your experimental system? Um, as a starting point for maybe applying this concept of this duality um, to, to sort of understand entanglement in a wider range of, of quantum systems. Okay, so you need a simple starting point if you want to sort of pursue this vision. Um, and it turns out that theoretically, um, the simplest system to describe um, is actually on, on the gravitation, from a gravitational perspective is a black hole. So um, it is um, conjectured that I can think of a black hole as equivalent to a maximally chaotic quantum system. So one where if I initialize um, this particular um, quantum bit in, in, or encode some information in this particular quantum bit, through interactions between these, these spins in my quantum system, that information will exponentially quickly kind of spread across all degrees of freedom in the system. Um, so there are sort of really concrete predictions here about how a quantum many body would, system would behave if it were dual to a black hole. Um, and so this raised for me the question of, you know, is this something that actually can be studied in the lab since there are specific, specific predictions about how quantum information um, should spread in such a system. And um, the challenge is this idea that information should spread kind of exponentially fast from one to all. Um, because in sort of typical experiments that one builds in the lab, information sort of propagates locally, um, you know, from one spin to the next in, in some 1D chain, for example, or from, um, uh, 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 or if I have atoms that are trapped and, and can move, the transport will be local. Um, and that means that sort of the time for information to spread from one to many scales linearly in the system size or even if interactions sort of decay in some power law fashion, um, the time will still scale as kind of a, a power law of, of the distance. Um, so to get some exponentially fast spreading of information, you would need something where um, the time for information to get sort of from point A to point B um, only goes as the logarithm of the distance. And that seems very unusual. And so you can ask the question, you know, is this something that, that one could actually access at all in the lab? Um, and there are actually toy models that people write down on paper that behave in this way. Um, uh, they involve things that to me as an experimentalist look very weird, like particles that can hop over kind of arbitrarily long distances. Um, actually, and, and they, they look weird to me if I think of those particles as atoms, um, these sort of massive objects that, that, who's, that should only sort of move locally. Um, but it turns out that it's very natural for us in the lab to build systems where um, we have not particles that can hop in a non-local fashion, but spin excitations that can hop in a non-local fashion. So the basic idea is if I have a system where I have um, a spin exchange interaction, where I can start with this spin up and this spin down and have a process um, where these, these two spins ex exchange their states in a way that is mediated by light, that interaction can be very long range because um, 
photons, for our purposes, travel essentially instantaneously at the speed of light. Um, so they can sort of link distant atoms in our system. So the general concept is um, to set up a situation where I have um, you know, one atom in the upstate that can flip its spin and in the process emit a photon that gets absorbed by another atom that flips its spin. Um, and, and that gives rise to this spin exchange process. Um, and in order to, for that to happen in a coherent fashion, right? I really want the photon to go from between these two atoms and not fly off in some other direction of space. Um, in order to do that, we um, um, place the system inside what's called an optical resonator. So we have these atoms um, situated between two mirrors um, and uh, uh, these allow us to have strong atom photon interactions and to arrange a situation where um, uh, we would like these also to be optically controlled. And so what we do is set up a situation where we have some um, control laser that I've shown here in purple that drives a process um, where an atom in a two photon process absorbs a control photon, emits into this resonator, and another atom absorbs a photon from the resonator and emits back into the control field. And in that process, they exchange their states. So that's the general concept. Um, those interactions can be as long range as this resonator mode is spatially delocalized. Um, and I should mention that this sort of field of having spin spin or having atom atom interactions mediated by light um, already has quite a strong track record in, in areas ranging from using those interactions to generate entangled states um, to also exploring um, um, uh, directions in quantum simulation. One key thing that we've been sort of um, adding um, to this kind of toolbox of, of cavity QED and photon mediated interactions is um, having a system where we simultaneously have strong atom light interactions, but also the ability to um, uh, detect in real space the dynamics and the spin dynamics of the system. Um, so the experiment, um, it looks something like this. We essentially have a cloud of atoms that is trapped in a standing wave of light. Um, so, so there's um, some standing wave between these two mirrors that pins the locations of the atoms spatially. Um, and the dynamics that I'll describe are purely going on in the internal state, so in the spin degree of freedom. Um, and essentially, we take pictures of the magnetization um, from, from below. Um, so as, as one illustration, here's an experiment where, again, horizontal is position, vertical is time. We initiated the system with um, some spin excitations in one region of our atomic cloud that I've called A here. And as a function of time, if we watch how the magnetization evolves, you'll see that um, uh, this. if I sort of look at a cut through region A, you'll see some oscillation in the density of spin excitations. And what's happening is that the excitations are kind of popping over to this other region that I've called B here and back. And so this is showing, um, one thing this shows is the sort of non-local character of the interactions. Um, uh, you might ask actually, why do they suddenly show up here and not sort of travel in some linear fashion from A to B? Um, but that's something we actually can understand by knowing that the strength of the interaction between kind of any two atoms um, is set by the strength of the atom light interaction. Um, and, and, and it turns out actually the atom light interaction in this particular experiment was strongest over here. And that's why the excitations first talked over there. Um, so we have these non-local interactions. Um, and um, I said sort of early in the talk that what I really wanted is something a little bit more like a function generator where I can really um, program something about the structure of these interactions. Um, and so um, some knobs that I might want, right? I might not just want the pairwise interaction to be governed just by whatever the intensity of the cavity mode happens to be. I'd like to be able to have some programmability of that. Um, so in the simplest case in our system, we get um, these interactions that have some form where every spin talks to every other and the coupling is just the product of some local intensities of, of the cavity mode. Um, you might want to be able to though, to go out to systems where one talks to many, um, that was relevant to this number partitioning problem I described before. Um, maybe you want something where the force strength of interaction between any two atoms um, is um, governed by distance on some exotic graph like this tree here. And it turns out, um, that um, this is something that we've been exploring as a route to, to realizing those sort of fast scrambling dynamics um, that you would expect if you had a quantum system analogous to a black hole. Um, or maybe you want some interplay of local and long range interactions. And that has been proposed, for example, um, to be um, value conducive to realizing spin liquid states that are of interest from um, condensed matter physics. So, um, so one knob that, that was just to introduce one knob that we would love to have is the spatial structure of the interactions. Um, um, but also you might want to be able to control the form of the interaction. So do I have this flip-flop that I can think of as the excitations hopping? Um, or do I have these Ising type interactions that I motivated earlier in, in the sphere of, for example, programming in some optimization problem into the system? Um, 
And maybe you'd like to control the sign of the interaction. Is it ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic? Um, so I'm going to start by actually showing you kind of in the simplest case where we have the um, the structure of the interactions is just given by the structure of the cavity mode um, that we have actually um, control though of the, of the form of the interactions and the sign of the interactions in a way that's um, really already starting to move in this direction of, of the function generator. And then I'll come back to the spatial structure at the end. Okay, so let's start by seeing how much control we can get over the, over the form of the interaction. Um, so just to um, uh, sort of clarify some notation here, I told you every atom talks to every other one in the simplest case. Um, and that actually allows me to sort of write down the Hamiltonian that we realize in the system um, in terms of a single collective object that's basically some weighted sum of the individual spins. And the weights are just the local intensity of the cavity mode. So that's why I've written the Hamiltonian in this simpler looking form here. And the first question we had is, um, can we tune um, this Ising coupling and this spin exchange coupling in order to sort of program in the form of our interactions? And the nice thing in our system is it turns out that that's something we can do simply by controlling the orientation of a magnetic field relative to the axis of this resonator. Um, so we have control over the form of the couplings, and we also can control the sign of the interaction simply by virtue of actually choosing the laser frequency or, or a laser detuning from resonance from the cavity. Um, so that's illustrated here in the plot on the right where the horizontal axis is the angle of the field. Um, and um, uh, I've shown you that sort of, I'm showing you that as a function of the angle of the field, this um, Ising coupling JZ decreases and the spin exchange coupling increases and we can realize either sign of that. Um, so this is just a, a summary, but to kind of give a feel for how we actually measure this, the type of experiment that we can do um, is for example, to say initialize, if I want to measure the strength of the Ising interaction, um, I can initialize some spins pointing along, let's say the, the minus Z direction. Those are these green spins here and some other spins in the xy plane. At t equals zero, I turn on the light and I watch how the spins um, evolve. So the color represents the phase. And similar to what I sort of introduced before, an Ising interaction should give a, a spin procession that, that um, about any spins that are pointed along z. And so you see the phase evolve. Um, and actually, um, I find it hard to read off these color plots. So I sort of like to animate it. Um, so if I ask sort of locally in the cloud, sort of what are, what are the spins doing, you'll see that um, they're, they're processing in some way. And actually the sign of the procession depends on the sign of some um, laser detuning. That's those are the two cases shown here on the, on the left and the right. Um, so uh, that's just an illustration of kind of how, so from the rate and the direction of the procession, we extract then this, we can measure the, the strength of the Ising coupling. And that, that's sort of the general approach. There's a similar method for kind of um, extracting the spin exchange couplings. Um, and that's one way we can sort of see from the dynamics, this control over the form of the interaction. Um, now, if I tell you, you know, I can control just by my laser frequency, the sign of the interaction, um, you know, one way to see that is, is this fact that the spins are processing in different ways, but really, particularly if you're like maybe a condensed matter physicist, um, and I tell you I can tune between ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic interactions, you would like to see some signature of that in like what the ground states or the low energy states of the system look like. So in particular, when I say the interactions of ferrom are ferromagnetic, um, what you want to see is some tendency for the spins to align. Um, so we were um, wondering, can, can we actually start to prepare the low energy states of the system? That's also interesting if you want to um, solve some problem that's, that's, that you can map to finding the ground state of the system. Um, but sort of conceptually, the general approach we can take to, to um, uh, prepare a low energy state of the system is to start in the ground state of a simple Hamiltonian, like all spins um, aligned along uh, the minus Z direction in a field along Z, but then slowly sort of ramp on the Hamiltonian of interest, which has some interactions, um, and um, see how the system evolves. So um, I'll just illustrate an experiment where we actually, we start with all spins aligned along Z. We slowly ramp on some field along the X direction and also some interaction. And we see kind of what, we take some picture of the magnetization at the end of that process. Um, the simple case without interactions is a useful kind of reference measurement. So let me show you that here. Um, so horizontal here is position in the cloud of atoms. Vertical is um, the final tilt of my field. And depending on that final tilt, you'll see that the spins are pointing more down than up, which just shows that we successfully are able to kind of prepare a state that is aligned um, with, with some uh, magnetic field, or actually it's an effective magnetic field in our system. Um, now, if we turn on interactions also, kind of slowly ramp on interactions in this process, then what we'll see at the end 
as a function of the tilt of our field, you see this a very sharp edge, where as the, I go from slightly tilted down to slightly tilted up, I have either all the spins pointing down together or all of the spins pointing up together. Um, and this is um, uh, what we would expect for this ferromagnetic Ising interaction, which is exactly what we have in this case, right? They all want to either align with each other down or up, and any small tilt in the field will kind of break the symmetry between all down and all up. Okay, so you, that's kind of this knife edge, this sharp knife edge um, is showing that there's a very high magnetic susceptibility at this point. Um, and uh, in the case of the anti-ferromagnetic interactions, in con by contrast, this sort of um, uh, tilt dependence of the magnetization washes out. So we can kind of summarize that in some plot of the magnetic susceptibility, which peaks um, at some critical point where the strength of the Ising interactions um, begins to overcome the strength of the transverse field. Um, so this peak in the magnetic susceptibility is a signature in, in this um, uh, long range interaction, interacting um, system of spins in the cavity of a transition from the paramagnetic towards a ferromagnetic state. Um, now, one, one reason that I, I like this measurement is because we can actually compare it with what happens if we have not Ising interactions, but spin exchange interactions. Okay. So here's um, actually the same measurement, but with spin exchange interactions. And interestingly, it's kind of the mirror image of what we get when we had only the Ising interactions. Um, so that's kind of weird, actually. It says that by having anti-ferromagnetic spin exchange interactions, I can see that same phase transition as I saw with ferromagnetic Ising interactions. So why, why does that work? Um, well, it turns out this is something you can understand um, by doing a little bit of algebra. <laughs> um, so to the extent that I can think of these many different spins coupled to my single mode of light, as a single large collective spin, um, that's the sum of the individual spins, um, there's actually a, a kind of a, an approximate symmetry where um, the collective um, z component squared, this fz squared, is almost the same as minus fx squared minus fy squared plus one additional term that just has to do with the length of the total spin. So if I start in the spin polarized state and I don't do anything that um, sort of destroys this 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 symmetry and and um, uh, then that, or, or in other words, that changes the length of the spin, then it shouldn't make a difference whether I have um, Ising interactions of one sign or spin exchange interactions of another. So this is kind of a, you know, a, a, a cute um, symmetry, but one of the reasons that um, it might be a little bit disappointing is if you want to use the system um, to actually study some quantum many body physics and not just the dynamics of a single large spin, then you would like to actually operate in a regime where I, this picture of, of thinking of this as one single object breaks down. And so we were curious, are there regimes where you actually see a difference between the Ising interactions of one sign and the spin exchange interactions of another? Um, and it turns out one case where you can see such a difference is if you ask about the dynamical response of the system to an inhomogeneous magnetic field. And actually, it turns out even without trying, <laughs> um, in our system, there was a small magnetic field gradient across the cloud. Um, so that if you don't turn on any interactions and you look at the phase of the spins as a function of time, you'll see some spiral texture evolving in the system. And that's just sort of the, you know, the rate at which the spiral texture forms is just a measure of the, the strength of the magnetic field gradient. Um, but if you turn on interactions, in particular, if we turn on spin exchange interactions, this picture looks much more boring. Um, so what's happening here, you basically see the phase is more or less staying uniform across the cloud. Um, and this is actually an effect where the interactions are preventing the spins from dephasing. Um, so I've kind of summarized this here. This is kind of showing the phase winding spatially across the cloud. If I have no interactions, that's the green, or actually if I have Ising interactions, those won't stop this phase winding. Um, but if I have spin exchange interactions, that phase winding is, 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 is suppressed dramatically. Um, and this we can actually understand by again, looking at this approximate, um, uh, uh, equality here between spin exchange interactions of one sign and Ising interactions of, of the other. Now, the key point here is this energy term that depends on the length of the total spin tells us that there's actually a gap in energy between manifolds of different total spins. So if the spins start out aligned, having this term here um, actually uh, prevents the spins from becoming misaligned because there's an energy gap to, to sort of the state of next smaller total, total collective spin. Um, and so we're seeing here as a function of the interaction strength, the sort of coherence of the system. So if I just look at the total spin of the system and ask um, um, uh, what is that, that average magnetization, that is enhanced now by the interactions. Um, 
this idea was was has been pointed out um, in notably in work by Anna Maria Ray and James Thompson, where they um, showed some spectroscopic evidence of this energy gap um, induced by the interactions. Um, a nice thing in our system is that by sort of really imaging the dynamics, we can directly see um, this dramatic difference between the dephasing in, in the case of no interactions or Ising interactions and the protection of coherence by the spin exchange interactions. Um, and this is something that is particularly of interest if you need to turn on light anyway, perhaps to generate some entangled state like a squeeze state. Um, these, this is saying if you have a choice of what type of interaction to generate, the spin exchange interactions could be the more robust method for protecting um, the coherence of the spin, which is also important for then having high signal to noise in your precision measurement. Um, but it's perhaps also particular, this actually gets now to the question that was asked earlier about what are some connections between these systems and for example, and these systems in the solid state. One of the contexts where this effect has been proposed as being useful is in systems where you have short range interactions and there's no reason uh, in, gen generically, those interactions will tend to be a source of dephasing unless you arrange your interactions to, 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 to specifically give you this kind of protection effect. And it says that spin exchange interactions could actually be kind of a resource there for generating um, uh, metrologically useful entanglement in a way that maintains um, the spin coherence. Um, so that is kind of, um, so I guess one other thing I want to say here is um, so far everything I've shown you here is just by looking at kind of um, some mean field dynamics. What is the average magnetization doing in a given region of, of the cloud? Um, but I kind of build the talk as one about um, um, quantum spin dynamics. Uh, so I want to convince you that there really are, um, is something quantum going on in these, in these experiments. Um, and actually it turns out one nice way to really see kind of um, the quantum aspect of the dynamics um, is to look at um, something other than just the, the local magnetization. So, so far, sort of most of what I've described to you in the cavity setting, I can think of as the magnetization um, in a sort of a more classical picture, the magnetization is coupling in some way to the polarization of the light and that acts back on the atoms. Um, but here I can also take um, one step further and work in a system where I initially have no net magnetization. Um, and it turns out that um, what's convenient for doing that is to exploit the fact that our spins in our system, I kind of ignored this effect before, but our spins actually, um, this system we're working with in, in, in the cavity experiments has a spin one ground state, which means that I can do an experiment where I initialize the system with all atoms in the M equals zero state of the spin one ground state, um, which means that there's no net magnetization. Um, and naively you might think, um, it's sort of in a sort of a classical picture that there should be um, no dynamics if I try to turn on um, some interactions. But quantum mechanically, if I turn on, for example, these spin exchange interactions, um, I should be able to have a process where I take two atoms in the zero state and convert them into a pair of atoms in the plus one and the minus one state. So we were curious, you know, does that happen? Here's an experiment where um, we basically initialize all atoms in this zero state. We turn on the light for some amount of time and um, after, after some period of time, we measure the populations in all three states. And we, in this case, I repeated this a hundred different times. Um, and what you'll see is that, um, first of all, you'll notice large fluctuations, um, but on the shots where we see population in the minus one state, there's also a large population in the plus one state. Um, and this is in fact um, familiar to phenomena that, uh, or similar to phenomena that have been in, observed in a couple of other physical systems. For example, in Bose-Einstein condensates, one ha can have collisional interactions that generate a pair of plus one and minus one atoms um, by virtue of two zero atoms colliding. It's also a little bit like um, if you're sort of more of an optics person, um, like spontaneous parametric down conversion, um, creating correlated photon pairs. Um, in both of these processes, one expects sort of a um, rapid, uh, uh, exponential actually growth in population um, in, in these um, two, what I'll call the side modes, the minus one and the plus one state, um, and also large fluctuations of the kind that we see. Um, so, um, and actually, uh, uh, let's see, something got out of order here, but in fact, you see um, as a function of time, this exponential growth in population, that's a signature of this kind of parametric amplification type process that's generating these correlated atom pairs. Monica, is there some asymmetry in that middle plot, the M0 plot, or am I imagining that? Um, yes, yeah, spatial asymmetry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's a great point. So there is some asymmetry. 
And in these experiments, um, they were done in more or less the same setting as one that I showed earlier in the talk, where actually the atom light coupling happened to be strongest toward the left side of the cloud. Mm. And so you may see that there's kind of more of this pair creation happening or that it's happening sooner in the left side of the cloud um, because of the inhomogeneous um, aspect of the coupling. Okay. Um, so it has to do with both, there's the structure of the cavity mode. We weren't quite in the center of the cavity in those experiments. And also then the, the atomic density and those two things convolved somehow give, determine the structure that you see here. Um, so, and actually you'll see in a moment that one thing we've done to sort of um, uh, uh, explore these physics in more detail is actually um, first have a cleaner configuration in which we're trapping the atoms. So I'll show that in a moment. Um, were there other questions at this point or, or can I show a few last measurements? Um, I think, yeah, we can let you wrap up here and then I'll yeah. ask some more questions at the end. Great. Okay. So, um, so one thing that we, we really love about this fact um, that we can generate these interactions in a cavity is in contrast to, um, let's say, direct collisional interactions that have been used to realize similar dynamics, you can start to ask the question, can we now um, use the light to, for example, control the spatial structure of the correlations that are generated um, by this pair creation process? Um, and in particular, the kind of dream is, um, uh, you know, ideally you'd like to be able to maybe have some system where you can optically program the structure of the long range interactions. Um, let me modestly say, um, we'd be really happy if we could sort of program in any translation invariant Hamiltonian. So I could, if I could control the structure of the couplings versus distance in my system. Um, and so to start to explore that, um, first of all, we decided let's trap our atoms a little bit more cleanly. So we're now working with an array of um, in the experiments, I'll show 18 small atomic ensembles. Each of them has a thousand atoms um, that gives us some collective enhancement of the interaction strength. Um, and uh, the, so the question is, can you now start to control um, the interaction strength as a function of distance in this array? Um, and that might sound um, um, hard to do, but it turns out there's a very natural way to do this in our system. And the idea is remember the form of the interaction, one form of interaction we can generate is this kind of a um, uh, flip-flop process where um, uh, if I start with two zero atoms, um, one of them um, gets sort of flipped up to the one state and the other one gets flipped down to the minus one state. And if I apply a magnetic field gradient across my system, then that process, instead of being something that can happen between any pair of atoms, it can only happen locally because if the atoms were far apart, there would be an energy cost to flipping this one up and that one down um, induced by the magnetic field gradient. So indeed, if we look at these pair creation dynamics in a magnetic field gradient, what I'm plotting here are spatial correlations between the plus one atoms and the minus one atoms. And you'll see that the correlations are strong only on the diagonal, which means plus one minus one pairs can only form um, locally on a particular site, um, on any site, but, but, but for every plus one atom, I, I get a minus one atom on that site. Now, if instead we take one more step and actually add two frequencies to our laser field, um, then actually you have a situation where the energy difference between these two photons can actually bridge the energy cost of generating a plus one minus one pair at some distance. And correspondingly, we start to see correlations appearing off the diagonal, which show that we've turned on these interactions at a particular distance set by the frequency difference between these control fields. Um, and indeed, if you vary that frequency difference, that's the vertical axis here, and look at correlations versus distance on the horizontal, you see that the correlations precisely track the frequency difference that we've programmed into our control field. Um, and I wanna highlight the precision of this control. So you really can now turn on interactions at a distance of you know, uh, 10 sites, but not 11 sites, right? By finely tuning the, the frequency um, uh, spectrum of the laser field. And um, this is kind of, uh, I would say a really exciting start for a direction where you can now start to ask if I have a multi-frequency drive field, I really can program in essentially arbitrary couplings as a function of distance. And you know the experimentalists who are listening know that actually you know programming the spectrum of a laser field, um, modulating it on the sort of 100 kilohertz scale is an easy thing to do in principle. Um, and so this is a direction that we're really excited to, to move um, soon. Um, but before sort of going to even fancier coupling patterns, we've just started to understand a little bit more, um, you know, what is actually, um, even in this simple case, there are interesting questions about, do we see short range correlations? Do we see longer cor range correlations? And you'll notice 
even with sort of short range interactions at a distance of two, you'll see correlations here at, at longer range um, that are multiples of that distance. Um, and one question we're interested in exploring is actually um, sort of how do the correlations also, also spread and what are the dynamics of these correlations? Um, I will just briefly flash up that this is something we have some preliminary measurements on, but that um, uh, is, is a, work in, a work in progress to explore how do the quantum correlations spread in the system. One reason we're interested in that is this um, question I raised earlier of can we use now this level of control to engineer models with non-local interactions that can ri give rise to this phenomenon of fast scrambling that's been um, explored as, as a model for um, what happens to quantum information in black holes. Um, and so there is, for example, a, a toy model um, where if you had interactions at, let's say, distances of one, two, four, eight, and 16 sites, dis just distances of powers of two, that's not something you would ever find in nature, but that's something we ought to be able to program in the lab. And um, that is something that um, you can't you know, calculate the dynamics of this exactly in, in, the, um, in a fully quantum model, but at least from sort of a semi-classical picture, this is believed to be something that would give rise to fast scrambling. And so it would be very exciting to be able to um, simulate this in, in the lab. Um, and it turns out that um, sort of beyond um, being of interest for uh, uh, observing this, this scrambling phenomenon, it also gives you a way of sort of changing effectively the geometry of the quantum system that you have in the lab. If the interactions are only local, then I essentially have just this linear chain, right, where nearest neighbors talk to each other. Um, but if one has sort of this, some um, suitable graph of these non-local couplings, you can actually sort of have something where the, the spins physically are located in, in, a, in a chain of sites. But in terms of the quantum dynamics, it really looks like they're the leaves on a tree. Um, and so this, again, has some connections to building in the lab um, toy models for quantum gravity. Um, so with that, I will just um, um, kind of wrap up and say that I've shown you um, two physical systems where we have a high degree of control optically of um, various aspects of, of the interactions between these um, spins encoded in cold atoms. So in, um, for example, in the cavity QED system, I've shown you programmability really of the form of the interaction, the sign of the interaction, and even the graph of the interactions in terms of the, the couplings versus distance. Um, and we've seen some um, useful effects like using the interactions to be able to actually protect the, the spin coherence. Um, we're excited to now um, take this, these tools and apply them towards generating spatially structured entangled states that are resources for metrology, um, simulating toy models of quantum gravity, um, and exploring some of these directions of can you harness these, this controllable quantum system to um, tackle some computational problems, for example, in, in combinatorial optimization. So with that, um, I think I will just um, wrap up and thank um, the, the team who have been working on these experiments. Um, the cavity experiments I showed in the latter part of my talk, um, uh, the most recent ones have been done by Eric Cooper and Avatar Parawell. Um, uh, and I've highlighted in red some past group members who also contributed significantly to that work. Um, the Rydberg experiments I showed earlier in the talk um, were driven by these um, four uh, people here in blue, Tori Borish, Agnan Markovic, uh, Jacob Hines and Shankari Rajagopal. Um, so with that, I will um, conclude and take any questions. Thank you so much, Monica. I think that was uh, a really great presentation. We have a lot of people who are saying thank you, and this was awesome. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I think one question I saw a little ways back, and actually I had the same question, so um, that's the one I'm going to ask. Uh, all the way near the beginning, you showed a graph comparing the Heisenberg limit. Yeah, sorry, it was like way far back. Yeah. Um, to the standard quantum limit. And a couple people were asking you to sort of elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Great. Like, yes. And especially why is the Copenhagen so far off on the right compared to all of the other? Oh, yeah. Okay. And I should say that, you know, I, I try to occasionally update this plot, but this is probably not even, I just want to mention a complete um, uh, sure. summary of sort of all the wonderful experiments that have been done exploring this, this sort of regime of entanglement enhanced measurement. Um, so what's going on in this plot? Great. So um, the black line is basically, uh, so, okay, so first of all, the horizontal axis is system size. So how many um, atoms do, do we have? Um, and the black line is what is the best measurement you can do in that system without entanglement, which essentially, um, because there are sort of square root of n fluctuations in like the, you know, when I measure how many spins are up versus down, that ends up giving, ri giving rise to a precision of a th phase measurement, let's say, if you want to measure how far the spins possess, that's one over square root of n. That's the black line. Um, 
The red line is what is the best that you can do with entanglement. And that turns out to be, um, if I ask about sort of the improvement um, in, in the phase uncertainty, that's a factor of square root of n. So the best I could do um, with entanglement is a phase uncertainty of 1 over n um, in, in sort of a single interrogation of my system. Um, and in order to realize that limit actually requires a, a highly entangled state. So to get precisely to that limit actually requires a superposition of all spins up and all spins down, which is sometimes called the Schrodinger cat state that's highly non-classical. Okay, so what are some of the points on the plot? So the thing at the very far right um, is a system that has a huge number of atoms by my standards. Um, it's um, 10 to the 12 atoms. Over, um, and this is actually a, um, a magnetometer. Um, uh, in in the um, uh, group of Eugene Polzik. Um, and that was an experiment that um, is using um, quantum de non-demolition measurements, if I remember correctly, um, on essentially like a, a dense atomic vapor. Um, mm -hmm. and, for, and one thing that's worth pointing out here is um, it's worth asking the question, what is actually... <laughs> you know, is, is the, what is the goal? So you might say yeah. the goal is to move towards this red line, but actually um, if you ask, how do I maximize the absolute precision of my sensor? I want to move actually, um, so the, the yellow sort of faint yellow lines are lines of, of equal um, precision. So you can make a more precise measurement by using more atoms or by entangling them, right? Um, and ideally, if all you care about is just the absolute precision of your measurement, how well you can measure a field in a fixed, um, time and you don't care about spatial resolution or any other figures of merit, then um, you might just want to move kind of diagonally up in this plot. Um, and and so, so this is kind of, even though it's only just above the standard quantum limit, this is a super important point because it's saying um, we can start to benefit from entanglement even at very large atom number where you have good signal to, to noise even to start with. Um, just to give sort of another illustration of kind of an extreme limit with very small numbers of particles like order 10 um, or up to 20, people have made um, um, states that are essentially like Schrodinger cat-like states that get very close to this, um, if it were, you know, precisely that state, um, uh, it would um, be at this Heisenberg limit. That is, um, in terms of absolute precision, um, uh, not as not as good. Um, but if you can start to maybe scale those states up and make arrays of those states, um, it, it first of all, um, if you can do it in a scalable way, then you could have, have more than just um, 10 or 20 particles. But also, um, if you're trying to um, enhance um, other figures of merit, like the dynamic range of your sensor, or have something with high spatial resolution, so you can't use that many particles, um, that's an important direction. And so mm -hmm. I think there's so much to explore um, in this kind of landscape between the standard quantum limit and the Heisenberg limit. And it's, yeah, a, it's exciting sure. there are a number of different physical systems where different directions can be pushed there. Yeah, yeah, that was actually another question. Someone was asking if you could sort of um, gleam anything into the fact that there's only one Radberg system on this plot versus I see a bunch of the uh, the blue ones and the, the atom ones. Yeah, I think um, so, you know, in principle, it would be nice to have this plot be multidimensional and one dimension that we could add would be time, like when were right. these experiments done. Right. Um, and um, I would say the Rydberg systems are really kind of rapidly evolving right now. And so that purple point is from um, um, probably last year. Um, and so it, it's really been sort of ex an exciting time in the past few years where these systems have shown sort of records um, in, in, ter in terms of fidelity of entanglement between neutral atoms um, and, and also starting to explore scalability to these um, cat states of, of, of 20 atoms. Um, some of these other experiments are, again, they're working with larger numbers of atoms um, and um, uh, in, for example, cavity QED systems. Um, and that's something where um, it's already been kind of um, a, um, about a decade since the, the first um, demonstrations of, of squeezing in those systems. Um, but there's continual improvements in terms of the degree of squeezing and also um, the ability to apply the kind of the, the methods in systems that are really relevant to making the best atomic clock. So for example, in um, alkaline earth atoms that are used for um, uh, optical optical atomic clocks um, that are really at the state of the art. And so there are so many like sort of extra axes I would like to add and <laughs> ideally yeah. in terms of like the implications of these different types of measurements, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really cool for me to see this squeeze state stuff come up in a bunch of different platforms. I worked with them a little bit um, when I worked on quantum amplifiers in graduate oh, school. Yeah. So it's cool to just like compare them across all these different these different platforms. Right. Um, 
But I guess in the interest of time, we should wrap up. So I want to really thank you for being here with us today and for this really great talk. A bunch of people in the chat are saying this was really awesome and they learned so much. And I know I personally learned a lot as well. So thank you again so much for being here. Um, and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed uh, the, the opportunity. So thanks a lot. Of course. All right. Great. Thanks so much. So we'll be back here next week, guys.